The Zimbabwe Controversy. This is basically about the intrigue of the ruins, found in Central Africa, mainly centered in Zimbabwe. The history of the various ruins can be split into four pieces of a bigger picture. Each piece of this jigsaw comprises of a section representing a different culture. These are split into, one, the Portuguese influence and trading forts. Two, the pit builders of Inyanga. Three, the terrace and fort builders. And finally four, the stone castle builders. We start with the Portuguese trading forts. Sadly, not much remains today of these structures, mostly all that's left are the base of the walls foundations and fortifications. The Portuguese built their trading forts from mud and unburnt clay brick. These trading forts can be found at Two Tree Hill, along the Angwa River, at Luanza Noko. And there was also another trading station near Shikari called Maramuka where an ivory figurine of the Virgin Mary was found. There are other sites along the Zambezi Basin and rivers. And an example of one is Masapa. However in the bigger picture, it seems that most sites of the trading forts are in northern Zimbabwe. The age of the Portuguese era is not too long ago, and is thought to be from about the 15th century. There was speculation that items found at Danan Gombe like the cannons were, evidence of the Portuguese in central Zimbabwe. However recent thought is that, these were captured by African tribes after various battles. The second piece of the jigsaw is the Inyanga ruins and culture. These ancient peoples lived in the cold highlands of Zimbabwe. A noticeable feature of their constructions were the use of pits, both to live in and to house domesticated animals. Forts were also crudely constructed. Both of the structures shown are in the Inyanga National Park. The people who built these ruins are thought to have lived here from the mid-15th century, and are thought to have descended from the Ninsenga people. One of the earliest explorers of the Inyanga ruins was Dr. Carl Peters, who visited the ruins in 1896. He was searching for gold but the Inyanga culture were not miners. Peters went on to write a book called The El Dorado of the Ancients, which is a fine example of early Zimbabwean exploration. Pottery found at Inyanga, date the period to about 1600 to 1800, which suggests that these ruins were not very old historically. The earliest pottery seems to be the Bombata tradition which has been dated to 2 to 300 AD. Moving on from the Inyanga ruins, the next part of the jigsaw are the fort and terrace builders. This culture built forts and residences in the middle of extensive terraces, some of which can be clearly seen still to this day. These are some of the most extensive ruined structures in the world. When we convert the color satellite image located just west of the Elam mission in the Inyanga North District, to a black and white image, we can see the ruins and terraces more clearly. By careful tracing of the enhanced black and white image, the terraces are seen to follow the contours of the hill. There has been some postulation by writers, that the terraces were used to concentrate and sluice for gold. This can be discounted, as while some terraces are found in gold fields, the terraces were used for cultivation, with the associated need to manage water runoff. Moving on from the terrace builders, we look at the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle, the Zimbabwe stone builders. This culture is identified by the many circular stone castles built, from mostly granite stone with beautiful stone work in Czech, chevron and dentel patterns. These patterns were often constructed with banded iron stone, enhancing the beauty. A great example of walls with pattern is the Nalatali ruins. Inside the stone fortresses the ancients built sturdy mud and clay round huts. The larger centers were also decorated with stone figurines of birds and in one instance, a man. The figurine shown has what appears to be armor and a belt. Some even suggested a mustache or beard. When the ruins of this era were examined it became clear that the construction of the walls was carried out in three distinct phases. The first period of construction produced the best stone walling, neatly laid out and well placed. The second period, usually on top of the first better walling, was less well placed and lastly, the third period, where it appears the stone was placed in a haphazard manner. One can conclude from that these periods of construction, occurred one after each other. Some ruins included more advanced structures like drains, as seen here in the Great Zimbabwe Ruin. 
Kami Ruins, is an excellent example of the utilization of small hilltops to build an extensive ancient town. The Kami Ruins also show us, fine first period walls, decorated with various patterns. With all the factors in mind, we have seen various ruins all over Central Africa. And so who were the builders, what influenced the ancients to build them and why did they stop? To understand this we need to look at the migration patterns of the ancients, trade routes, commercial factors, wars, and climatic conditions. We understand the Portuguese were one of the first to record in writings of the existence of the inland civilizations. But were these the first? In 947 AD, an Arab geographer called al Masudi wrote of the gold trade through Sofala, however the word Arab was used loosely to describe Muslim traders, Indians, Persians, and East Africans. So the ruins were already in existence then, which is supported by carbon dating sites. Climatologists have determined that Central Africa experienced a greater rainfall over 500 years ago, if compared with today's climate. This is supported by the terrace builders, whose agriculture flourished then, but whose terraces today stand barren. It is suspected that climate change forced them to abandon their terraces for greener pastures. While early chroniclers reported that Sofala was a major trading hub for the interior, we now know that this term, was used to describe the area between the mouth of the Sabi or Sabi River, and the Buzi River mouth. Each river being used when suitable for canoe or small boat navigation. The other rivers used to penetrate the interior were the Zambezi, Angwa and Pungwe rivers. We next look at the types of structures found when Europeans first entered the interior of Central Africa. These were the traditional mud and thatch huts, circular in shape. The question remains to this day, why would a culture go from magnificent stone structures to poorly made thatched clay huts? Or more correctly, to live in very well-made clay huts with thick walls, within stone protective structures. As we see here at Nalatali ruins, the structures used to live in were well made, and portions still remain with the red ochre inner paint. We know that the early Shona tribe entered Central Africa from the north, as early as the 11th century, but this could have been as late as the 15th century. This age was determined through oral traditions. However the gold mining and smelting and iron ages have been determined as being much older. And the stone castle type ruins predate this by at least two centuries. We can add another date into the mix. Monk's Cop is a cave in the Sipilelo district which contains skeletons and artifacts, which were carbon dated back to the 13th and 14th centuries. The artifacts found were attributed to non-Shona people from the north, possibly riverine Tonga peoples. So we know that between the birth of Christ or the Iron Age, at around 200 AD, and 900 AD or the Leopard's Copy culture, a nation of people started to build stone castles in the Zimbabwe style. We also know that without any prior historical record, these people learned how to build the stone structures, and did so on a magnificent basis. However, by examining pottery from the Kami area, and carbon dating it we can determine two ages for the Leopard's Copy culture. These are the Mambo styles, dating from 900 to 1280. And, then the Mapangubwe styles, which dates from 1150 to 1480. Archaeologists have wrongly associated the ancient iron and gold mining and smelting period, with the Zimbabwe-style stone constructions. There are many places where one activity occurred and not the other. We know from the writings, as previously mentioned that the gold trade was developed by 900 AD. It's reasonable to think, that the ancient Zimbabwe-style ruin builders were influenced by the iron and gold smelting culture, and brought these operations into the most important structures of their own culture. This can be seen at Great Zimbabwe where smelting operations were conducted in the Acropolis, and at Manianga. There are other sites, including Tagati ruins. Remember it wasn't only gold, but iron, copper and tin. Many archaeologists only looked at a specific ruin, rather than looking at the bigger picture. If they had they would have noted, there are quite a few instances where whole ruins were moved, or the stones recycled to another site. 
A case is the Regina Ruins complex where stone were moved from one granite outcrop to another and a stone structure rebuilt. We also see this type of activity where granite was carried to a construction site from some 20 kilometers away, as the site where the ruins was found had no granite. There has been little explanation from archaeologists, about how skeletons with gold artifacts were dug up from underneath the ruined stone walls. Nor have they explained the seven-foot skeleton found with shin bones, of over two feet, this equates to five or six inches longer than a normal person. Not only that the bones had gold anklets weighing over 16 ounces. This skeleton was packaged and sent to England, sadly no further trace can be found of it. When the mining techniques of the ancients was examined, and a study of the hundreds of ancient mine workings, both for gold and iron, only primitive tools were found, namely stone hammers. Yet the ancients were able to extract gold from complex ores, requiring furnace treatments, washing, mixing with primitive fluxes and smelting. So the perplexing question is? Where did the ancients acquire the expertise? Where did they learn how to smelt metals and how did they learn to mine deep into the earth? For we know that they went to depths of over 200 feet. And where out of nowhere, did they learn how to make magnificent stone castles? While we are 100% certain that the labor provided to mine, smelt and build stone structures came from African cultures, what influences were there, to make them change to being stone builders? We have to look at possible sources of influence, and these can only be the trading routes. We need to look at the entrances, places like Stone Door at the junction of the Sabi or Sabi River, the Buzi River where it enters the highlands of eastern Zimbabwe, the Handi Valley where the Pungwe and other rivers enter in Yanga, and of course the mighty Zambezi River. Archaeologists still have a lot of explaining to do, or rather a lot of investigative work still to do. We can safely date the four pieces of the jigsaw. The Portuguese era, and period of influence that appears to have decimated the inland gold trade by Arabs, Muslims and Indians. This would be from about 1500 AD to 1800 AD. The Inyanga stone pit builders can be dated from pottery to about late 1500 AD to 1800 AD when they were assimilated by Shona tribes migrating from the north. Their construction influence is thought to have been from the trading route up the Pungwe River. The terrace builders are thought to have started from about 1200 AD and lasted till 1600 AD. This culture may have been the ancestors of the Inyanga culture, and were closely related to the Inyanga stone builders. Their influence came from the Zambezi River and possibly the Sena tribes. Finally we can date the Stone Castle Builders era. Historians like Dr. Kent Rasmussen, believe that construction of the Great Zimbabwe, commenced in 1200 AD. Iron Age peoples were known to build crude stone walls around their dwellings, and we have evidence from the late Iron Age of pottery, that pushes Rasmussen's date back to the 9th century. Then we have evidence of villages on hilltops in the Latsani headwaters, which is in Botswana, that carbon dated back to the 8th century. So we can date the stone castles back to not before the 8th century, and we know they were still being used in the early 18th century. We know that various cultures used the ruins like squatters, but who had nothing to do with their construction, and who had no influence over their design. So the Zimbabwe controversy is not about who built them, but rather where did the knowledge, techniques, and designs originate from? Did this come from migrating cultures from the north? From outside influences? Speculation remains as to where are the burial grounds of all the inhabitants of the ruins are. And why do some ruins show signs of a violent overthrow? Perhaps we will never know, and that is why the ruins of Zimbabwe wherever they are, are so special.